Good evening, board, and uh, I would like to call to order the Wednesday, April 15th Board of Directors meeting. Uh, with, with this, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, on your screen right now is the virtual meeting procedure. Please feel free to review it. Uh, as a reminder for agenda items, questions, comments, please use the raise hand button to indicate you have a question or would like to speak. Once it is your turn, staff will unmute your microphone and call on you to speak. Please make sure you are also unmuted on your end. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the question box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions related to the agenda items. The next item is roll call. At this time, Melinda will unmute directors and alternates in the GoToWebinar application for roll call. If your computer is also muted, please unmute yourself by pressing the microphone icon. If you are joining by phone only, press star six to unmute yourself. When Melinda is finished, there will be a brief pause to remute everyone and unmute the chair and panelists, and she will then notify the chair of the quorum. So Melinda, please take it over. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. At this time, um, just as a reminder to everyone to add on to what our chair said, uh, just make sure that all directors and alternates have a green microphone uh, so we have the ability to hear you and you can all speak. All right. So at this time, I'm going to unmute all uh, directors and alternates. Okay. And with that, I'll give everyone just a second to make sure that they have a green microphone and they are okay. able to speak. And if you have any background noise, if you could just turn anything down or turn your computer speakers down, that would be helpful as well. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. At this time, I will go ahead and start roll. Uh, Eva Henry. Steve Odoricio. Jeff Baker. Bill Holland. Elise Jones. Here. Thank you. Deb Gardner. William Lindstedt. Here. Okay. Randy Wheelock. Here. Nicholas Williams. Here. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Partridge. Thank you very much. Laura yeah. Thomas, Ron Angles, Libby Zabo. Here at my house. Thank you, Libby. Uh, Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Mike Kaufman. Allison Coombs. Larry Vidum. David Spellman. Aaron Brockett. Present. Margo Ramson, Adam Cushing, Chris Jordanelli, Roger Hudson. Here. George Teal. Present. Tammy Maurer. Mike Sutherland. Jeremy Fay. Randy Wheel. Glad to be here. Thank you, Randy. Uh, Richard Champion. Nicole Frank. Craig Hurst. Jackie Thomas. Catherine Whitman. Steve Conklin. Here. Linda Olson. Here and flattening the curve. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Bill Gipp. Linda Montoya, Celeste Arner, Drew Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Rachel Binkley, Ryan Tuchere, Jim Dale, here. Paul Hasseman. George Lance. Dave Kerber. Mike Hillman. Stephanie Walton. Tim Barnes. J. 
Jacob Labure, Isaac Levy, uh. Karina Elrod, <clears throat> Pamela Grove, Larry Strock, present, Wynn Shaw, present, Joan Peck, Ashley Stolzman, here, Connie Sullivan, here. Joyce Palazuski. Colleen Whitlow. Paul Sutton. Sean Frey. Chris Larson. Julie Duran Mullica. Here. John Dyack. Here. Sally Daigle. Dave Black, Sandy Hammerly, here. Jessica Sandgren, here. Herb Atchison, here. Bud Starker, you're at home. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Adam Zarin, Rebecca White, here. And Phil Van Meter, here. All right, and I will take one moment Melinda, to. Melinda, this is Karina. Oh, I'm sorry, Gwen. Melinda, sorry, yes? this is Karina. I just got unmuted. Uh, so Karina Elrod from Littleton. Okay, perfect. And I also see Deborah that I. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Gwen. Roger okay. Partridge from Douglas County. Perfect. Thank you, Roger. And. Um, <laughs> Melinda, this is Doug Rex. I know Eva Henrys is also online. She texted me. Okay, thank you for that. And then I, I also have a few uh, hands raised that look like Adam Cushing. Uh, I believe that you weren't able to answer. Um, so if you'd like to go ahead and stay here, let us know you're here. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Perfect, thank you, Adam. George right. Lance with Greenwood Village is here. Perfect, thank you very much. Junie Joseph? From Boulder is also here. Thank you, Junie. All right, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone again. So one moment. Okay. All right, and with that, Mr. Chair, uh, we do have a quorum. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, with, with us having a quorum, I'd like to move to the next item, move to approve the agenda. We will entertain a motion and a second for approval of the agenda. Please use the raise hand icon to indicate you would like to make a motion. You will be called on and unmuted to verbally state the motion. Melinda, do, do we have a motion? All right, I'll give everyone a moment to get those hands raised. All right, looks like we have a motion from Randy Wheel. I will go ahead and unmute you now so you can approve the motion. It looks like you're self-muted, so you'll need to unmute yourself, Randy. Okay, I move to approve the agenda. Um, thank you, Director Wheel. Uh, we have a motion to approve the agenda. Do we have a second, Melinda? It looks like we do have a second from uh, Director Strzok. Let me go ahead and unmute you. All right, and uh, you looks like you're self-muted. Uh, yep. I'd like to uh, second that motion, please. Great, thank you, Director Strzok. So we have a we have a motion by Director Wheel, second by Director Strzok. Um, Melinda will once again unmute directors and alternates uh, only for a verbal vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 That was amusing. Any abstentions? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, the next uh, the next item is report of the chair. Um, the The report on performance and engagement committee. Uh, I talked to Director Flynn uh, previous to this uh, this uh, board meeting. Uh, they have not met yet, uh, so he looks forward to uh, updating the board next month on their meeting. The next item is report on finance and budget committee. Director Conklin, 
Uh, do you have a report for the board? Thank you very much. Yes, we uh, met just before this meeting. We approved a uh, resolution authorizing the executive director to contract with CDHS for the Dr. Cog AAA and to allocate and distribute up to $21.5 million in Older Americans Act and state funds for senior service dollars for the period of July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. Uh, we also discussed Dr. Cog's receipt of federal COVID-19 emergency relief funding, and we discussed expansion of the Veterans Direct Care Program uh, at our meeting tonight. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Conklin. And, and with that, I'd like to move on to the next item, report of the Executive Director. Executive Director Rex, do you have a report? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you and your families are safe and healthy. It's a very difficult time, I know, for everybody. And so please hang in there. Um, we did attempt to streamline the agenda this evening. You'll notice we have four items on the consent docket. Um, and as we've already noticed, and I know I've been getting some text through this, uh, you know, this remote meeting environment is new to all of us. And so I ask you for your patience this evening uh, in the event we experience uh, some unexpected, I should say expected, unexpected technical issues. So, so hang in there. Um, Speaking of the consent docket, I just wanted to point out one. So you'll notice on the consent agenda item seven, Roman numeral uh, four, that uh, we have the recommendations of the nominating committee for PE and, and F and B membership. Um, please note if you currently serve on one of those two committees and don't see your name on the list, please don't fret. All that means is that the reason you don't see your name is because you are not up for reappointment. Um, the appointments are for two years. So, um, so you're still on the committee. So I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that because um, I had a question or two about that. Um, so the 2020 award celebration that was scheduled for April 22nd, we obviously have postponed that and you should have received notice um, uh, with respect to that. We are hoping um, to reschedule this in the fall. We're looking at some September dates right now. Uh, we're working with, uh, with Mile High, um, stadium and and um so hopefully we can arrive at a date but we'll keep you guys surprised of the latest developments with associated with that the 2020 bike to work day as of today um we are still planning on holding that event on june 24th but of course we will be um following all the relevant news and guidance related to covid 19 and um there's a chance of course we could have postponed that until the fall so stay tuned um Dr. Cog is uh, supporting the American Planning Association in, in an effort to get greater participation on their, on their online COVID town hall series. Um, we are promoting upcoming, upcoming town halls via social media, but you, you can also find them on the Colorado APA website. Recent topics included how planning departments can successfully transition to remote office environments, as well as uh, another one was engaging stakeholders in in a time of stay stay at home orders and social distancing. Um, tomorrow morning session, we'll share examples of what communities can be doing now to lay the foundation for a resilient community and economic recovery. So some pretty fascinating topics, uh, obviously germane to the environment in which we find ourselves. So if you have um, you know, questions or want some additional information on that, please reach out to myself or Brad Calvert. And last but not least, I just wanted to give you guys a quick update on the COVID-19 um, environment that we find ourselves. And like you, we're here at Dr. Cog, we're, we're trying to conduct business as best we can during this very trying time. Um, our mandatory teleworking policy appears to be working well. Um, we're, we, we, we've extended that policy out to April 26th to comply with the governor's executive order. Um, so, um, and we of course anticipate that that will probably be extended. Um, We've always had a very robust teleworking program, so we kind of hit the ground running with, uh, in, in that respect. Um, so, but don't get me wrong, I mean, I think some of the monotony of working from home is starting to set in, and uh, we are definitely concerned and sensitive to uh, possible isolation of staff and are taking the appropriate steps to, uh, to alleviate any issues. Um, well, you know, all staff have been rock stars during this time. Um, I would like to recognize the tremendous efforts that are, that are occurring in the Erie Agency on Aging side of our shop. Um, and I won't belabor the point because I know JL has, a, has an informational briefing later on in the agenda. Um, but, but, you know, I, if, you know I, there is a little bit of a silver li lining during this pandemic. Um, 
I've been so pleased and impressed by the level of community that we're seeing um, related to this and the work that we're doing to help our, our aging population out there. Um, the willingness to work together to make sure our resources are being pinpointed to where they need to go has been awesome. Um, so I just wanted to personally thank everyone for, for making the best out of a very difficult situation. Last but not least, um, I, I wanted to make sure that, that you all were aware, because some of you guys um, know Connie Garcia very well. Connie Garcia, who's the, uh, my executive assistant, she has announced her retirement effective May 1st. And while we are we are obviously going to mess her terribly around here, we wish her nothing but the best. And um, and uh, and you know I'll, I'll keep you updated on any news that I have. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. Um, on to the next item, public comment. Uh, we will now open the meeting for public comment at uh, 6:48. The chair requests that there are no there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the Board of Directors. We will now unmute all participants of the meeting. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button, and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up and uh, your line will then be muted. Linda, do we have anybody uh, available for public comment by raised hands, or are you going to unmute uh, everybody at this point in time? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. At this time, I will go ahead and unmute everyone to give them the ability to speak. <clears throat> so at this time, uh, everyone has the ability to speak. If anyone does have a public comment and has the ability to raise their hand, please do. Uh, otherwise, if you are on the phone, just make sure you hit star six so you can start speaking. Anybody for public comment, please? Um, hearing none, uh, Melinda, did you have any raised hands at all on, on your end or any indication that we do have public comment? I am seeing no hands raised at this time. And with that, we will close public comment at 649. Thank you very much. The next item is uh, the consent agenda. Uh, I will ask at this time if there are any requests from directors to pull an item from the consent agenda for further discussion. Please use the raised hand icon and you will be called on and unmuted. Melinda, are there any hands raised to pull uh, an item from the consent agenda. Uh, I am seeing a hand raise. It looks like it's from uh, Herb Atchison. Uh, Mayor Atchison, if you'd like to speak. It's not for a removal, just for a move to motion to approve the consent agenda. Great. Perfect. We, we have a, uh, a motion by Director Atchison to approve the consent agenda. Um, Melinda, second. A this is Elise Jones, I'll second. <laughs> second by Director Jones. Okay, here we go. Everybody get ready. All in favor, say aye. 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 Yeah, yeah. Aye. <laughs> All right. Do we have any That's names? Awesome. Any names? Any abstentions? Uh, it looks like these, this motion carries unanimously. Melinda, please take a moment to meet everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me do that now. All right, All right Chair. Um, on to the action item. Uh, the next item is a discussion of urban arterial multimodal safety improvement program and eligibility rules and selection process. At this time, Ron will give the presentation. Uh, Ron and Melinda will, will field all questions. Uh, once questions have concluded, uh, Melinda will then uh, hand uh, hand it back to me to ask for a motion. So thank you very much, and Mr. Papstorf, please uh, please take it from here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ron Papstorf here, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations. Uh, Mr. Chair, can you see my screen? I can. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here this evening. Um, we've been uh, talking about this Urban Arterial Multimodal Safety Improvements Program for a few months now. You'll recall that uh, back on February 19th, we um, 
presented information about this idea to the board at the, at the February 19th board meeting. Uh, we had an April 1st board work session relating to the eligibility criteria and selection process for the proposed uh, safety improvements program. Um, so I did want, I'll, I won't dwell on this too much, but I do want to just um, uh, remind everyone of sort of the genesis of this and where we've been. So um, this really um, came up out of some significant conversations between CDOT staff and Dr. Cog staff as we were uh, preparing uh, both the regional vision, zero, uh, regional vision Zero plan for the Dr. Cog area, as well as the state updating its statewide safety plan. Um, and just for a little bit of um, history, in 2017, um, 266 people were killed in crashes on, the Den on Denver's Denver region streets and highways. Um, during the five-year period from 2013 to 2017, we had 8,700 crashes uh, that resulted in either a fatality or a severe injury. And during that same five-year period, um, 1,149 people died on regional roadways um, in the Denver area. So a significant um, long-standing issue, and we recognized a, a real need and then an opportunity to um, uh, try to take some concrete steps to address those issues. Um, so the program purpose is really a joint effort between CDOT and Dr. Cog to support uh, projects that improve safety, especially safety for vulnerable users, bicyclists and pedestrians who are, as you recall, disproportionately represented uh, in those fatal crash uh, data, um, particularly along urban arterials within the Metropolitan Planning Organization area of Dr. Cog and consistent with CDOT's and Dr. Cog's Vision Zero efforts. Um, the opportunity um, for this action uh, began when um, CDOT um, allocated $25 million of Senate Bill 267 funds uh, for the Region 1 part of, of Dr. Cog, $25 million for urban arterial safety improvements, and then an additional $26 million for um, transit-related funds out of Senate Bill, uh, transit related improvements on arterial streets within the within region one of CDOT from 267 funds. So that totals $51 million that was available. Um, we also learned that the state of Colorado received a $37 million supplemental apportionment of surface transportation block grant um, funds. Those are federal transportation funds allocated to the state. Of that 37 million, um, approximately $9 million uh, by formula would be allocated and directed by Dr. Cog. Those are SDBG Metro funds. Approximately $3 million would go to the other four MPOs around the state based on population. Um, $7 million uh, would be reserved for small, urban, and rural areas around the state. And then $17 million would be available to CDOT to allocate anywhere statewide. Um, in our conversations with CDOT, uh, we um, broached the idea of leveraging the Dr. Cog directed $9 million of this unanticipated SDBG Metro funds with the $17 million um, of statewide funds available to CDOT to create an additional $26 million urban arterial multimodal safety improvement set aside program in the Dr. Cog MPO area. Um, this is a real opportunity to focus investments on um, identified safety and mobility needs. Um, with a focus on locations of highest injury and crashes. It's an opportunity uh, within Dr. Cog to leverage the Dr. Cog directed funds by nearly two to one. Um, um, it allows the use of the surface transportation block grant funds throughout the region, remembering that the Senate Bill 267 funds are dedicated specifically only to the region one, the CDOT region one part of Dr. Cog. Um, and um, we really wanted to craft this idea to focus on the um, most significant needs, and there, there are needs throughout the region, um, but the funds would not be targeted by regional or sub-regional share. We really would have an open and competitive process to allocate funds uh, throughout the region to the highest priority uh, needs. Um, this action does require an exception to the 2020 to 23 TIP waiting list protocol that I've discussed previously with the board. Um, typically, these fun, new unanticipated funds would flow to our waiting list process. So this action in creating this program does require 
uh, an exception to that waiting list protocol. Um, it also, uh, important to note, really uh, from CDOT and Dr. Cog's perspective, is um, a mutual agreement. So the allocation of the $9 million of Dr. Cog directed funds through your action um, is contingent on, this, on CDOT and the Transportation Commission taking action to commit their $17 million uh, into this program in the Dr. Cog region. Likewise, CDOT's action through the Transportation Commission to commit their $17 million is contingent on Dr. Cog agreeing to commit the $9 million. The program goals uh, for the safety program are to reduce fatal and serious injury crashes on the region's transportation system, um, particularly on the non-interstate, non-limited access facilities. I think um, CDOT and Dr. Cog agree that while there are safety problems throughout the region, uh, the ones where we believe we have the highest opportunity, the best opportunity to big, make the biggest impact is on those um, surface transportation facilities, uh, those arterials and collectors throughout the region uh, that have been identified through our higher injury network um, effort. Um, support a transportation system that safely accommodates all modes, um, that we improve transit access and multimodal mobility, supporting the development of connected urban and employment centers throughout the region, and providing safe access uh, to opportunity and mobility for um, all residents um, throughout the region, particularly those vulnerable users. So as a reminder, the available funding and eligibilities uh, that we're proposing in partnership with CDOT include the three funding categories, the Senate Bill 267 funds I described, as well as the combined $26 million surface transportation block grant funds. The, since the Senate Bill 267 funds are state funds allocated by the legislature to CDOT for state highways, they are limited to projects located on arterial state highways. Um, the surface transportation, transportation block grant funds um, are available, though, throughout the entire Dr. Cog Metropolitan Planning Organization area on any federal aid eligible roadway, um, especially those that are on the high injury network um, that otherwise meet the program criteria. And federal aid eligible roadways. Um, really are basically any collector and above classified facility. And as part of the application process, we will have a map available to all local jurisdictions indicating all of those federal aid eligible roadways throughout the region. Um, because of the um, particular nature of the way the Senate Bill 267 funds are raised, um, there is a need to move those funds forward fairly quickly. So all eligible and funded projects have to be able to complete all of the project activities and submit all billings to CDOT by no later than June 1st of 2024, so about a year from now, uh, a, little, a little over four years from now, pardon me. Um, applicants may specify a preference for um, state-only funds uh, through this process uh, if they're within the Region 1 part of Dr. the CDOT Region 1 part of Dr. Cog um, on projects for projects on state highways. Uh, but CDOT and Dr. Cog at this point can't guarantee a specific funding source for a particular project until we uh, look at all of the project submittals um, and formulate a recommendation for funding. Um, we are not putting limits on the number of applications per jurisdiction. Uh, we are not limiting um, applications by geographic area within the region. We're um, proposing to have a minimum grant request of $250,000 per project and a maximum grant request of $15 million. Um, that's the grant request. Um, all grants would require a local match at this point of 20% uh, minimum uh, to be eligible for the funds. Um, the, eligible, the actual evaluation criteria that we are proposing uh, in partnership with CDOT obviously uh, are listed here, including the relative weightings for those categories. So safety being uh, primary at 35%, um, enhancing uh, mobility for vulnerable users and transit access um, is 25%. A group of other considerations um, to be evaluated weighted at 10%, including um, the extent to which the project involves innovation, a new approach to um, addressing safety problems, technology, uh, the opportunity uh, to devolve a state highway to local jurisdiction and the cost effectiveness of the project. All of those combined are weighted at 
Um, public support and local match um, are important, but weighted at 10%. And then obviously readiness, uh, the extent to which the applicant demonstrates that the ability to meet those project delivery requirements that I talked about before, weighted at 20%. The application selection process, I would say disregard the dates at this point, but I do want to focus on the process and I'll get to the dates a little bit later. So project applications would be scored by a scoring and selection panel made up of representatives from CDOT Region 1, uh, CDOT Division of Transit and Rail, um, Dr. Cog, as well as RTD. So that panel would score all eligible applications uh, that are submitted for funding. Um, those That scoring would go to an advisory committee that would be made up of two CDOT staff and one staff person from each of the eight Dr. Cog subregions uh, to review the scoring and formulate a, rec a funding recommendation. That funding recommendation would go back to the scoring and selection panel to review that advisory committee recommendation and uh, make a final recommendation to the, um, select to the um, governing bodies of CDOT and Dr. Cog. Um, including going through the Dr. Cog committee process and the uh, CDOT Transportation Commission um, we put this together. We were anticipating uh, that we would release this call for projects next week, um, anticipating that the Transportation Commission uh, would take this up at their meeting tomorrow um, and we would be ready to, ready to roll with the application. Obviously, given the situation with everyone's uh, response to COVID-19 and some fiscal uncertainty that's out there, uh, the dates here are not being approved tonight. They are not included in the eligibility criteria or selection process. Um, and at this point, the commission is anticipated to take this up at their May meeting um, and um, subject to approval by the Dr. Cock board. Uh, we hope that the commission will take that up uh, at their May meeting and likewise make that approval. We have good support at RTC from the commissioner from the transportation commissioners on RTC uh, at their meeting yesterday morning. Um, obviously, there is some chance that um, based on financial impacts that might cause some problems, but we felt it was important to move this forward and uh, uh, get this process rolling and ask the commission to take this up uh, at their um, earliest opportunity. As I mentioned earlier, um, our commitment is contingent on uh, the commission agreeing to allocate their $17 million to this program. If they do not, then uh, we will take the $9 million of Dr. Cog directed um, SDBG funds and roll that into our waitlist process, uh, just as we've begun doing with an additional $13 million uh, that we've started that process on. And so we would, we would just roll that in. Um, knowing that uh, there's those conversations going on and knowing that everyone's in a little bit of a, of a, a situation dealing with COVID-19. Obviously, it would have made sense to delay the call for projects anyways. Uh, so at the very least, uh, we, would, we would start to open this call um, towards the end of May. So everything here is probably delayed about a month or so, depending on how much longer uh, things go on. So finally, we do have a uh, proposed rec a recommended, recommended motion for you this evening. This action um, does approve that, wait that exception to the waitlist protocol, as well as approves the um, eligibility <clears throat> rules and selection process for the Urban Arterial Multimodal Safety Improvements Program. Uh, you have, um, we, with this, we have a unanimous recommendation from, from the TAC um, on the um, exception to the waiting list protocol from February 24th. We have a unanimous recommendation from TAC on March 23rd for the rules and selection process. And the RTC did recommend approval uh, yesterday morning of both the, this, this motion, the exception to the wait list protocol and the eligibility rules and safety and selection process. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Melinda, are there any questions? 
Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it looks like our first one is from uh, Director Atchison. Let me go ahead and unmute you. All right, Director Atchison, you have the ability to speak. Thank you, ma'am. Hey, Ron, on this regards to this, this is all dedicated toward region one, but we have people that are in more than one region. Is that correct? Um, Director Atchison, so the entirety of this program combined, uh, the $51 million of, um, let me go back to that. So the, the combined $51 million of Senate Bill 267 funds is for the re for CDOT Region 1 portion of Dr. Cog. That's correct. The $26 million we're talking about tonight um, is, would be available for projects located within the entire Dr. Cog MPO boundary area. So that, so remember, Region 1 of CDOT basically does not include Boulder County or Southwest Weld County parts of Dr. Cog. Um, right. The SDBG funds, the $26 million would be available throughout the throughout the region. That's what I wanted to clarify, because we do have people, like you said, in, in Region 1 and Region 4. So we're only talking about the $26 million for right now. Correct. correct? But the, the intent between at this point between CDOT and Dr. Cog and the, and the um, process, the criteria, the selection process that uh, we're proposing this evening does include that $51 million of 267 funds as well. So in total for the region, it's approximately $77 million going to safety and multimodal improvements on arterials throughout the region. Um, there's just some difference about the geographic eligibility for the various portions of the funds. And you indicated in the other slide that uh, CDOT was donating $9 million to this COG. Do you know how much is being uh, predicated to the other COGS within the state? So actually, so by by federal law of that $37 million there, and I flip back to that slide, Director Atchison, um, $9 million of the $37 million is allocated to Dr. Cog um, as an MPO um, of the SDBG funds. So that, that's under that's under federal law and federal federal formula. There's another three million dollars that goes to the other um, the other four MPOs in the state. Okay. Thank you. No other questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Melinda. Next next person, please. Next question. Absolutely. It looks like um, our next question is from Aaron Brockett. Um, Director Brockett, you are self muted and able to talk. Great, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Great. So thanks for this. It looks like a fantastic opportunity. Can you talk a little bit about the kinds of projects that will be um, eligible, like the kinds of improvements that um, uh, that will be looked for as part of this? Yes, sir. Uh, they were actually included in the packet. Okay. Yeah, I just thought it'd be helpful to call it out as part of the presentation. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I apologize. I'm gonna. You probably can see my messy screen. So uh, this is a this is a good list if you can see that uh, Director Brockett of the um, kind of eligible project types that we've identified with CDOT. Um, they include a, a lot of, of opportunities really focused at addressing uh, specific safety needs. We don't want to dictate the solution. Uh, we want the local governments to work with us to identify the the appropriate solution to to the problem at that local area. But it uh, any Bicycle pedestrian facilities, including sidewalks, uh, pedestrian crossings and amenities, protected bicycle facilities that would improve safety, um, pedestrian safety enhancements, such as pedestrian actuated crossings, um, rapid flashing beacons at crossings, intersection crosswalk improvements, curb extensions to shorten uh, crossing locations, traffic calming work. Um, 
pedestrian scale lighting, other street enhancements, things that slow down uh, travel and reduce conflict points, raise medians, traffic signal improvements, um, transit amenities. Um, and again, we want to we want um, local jurisdictions and applicants to bring forward the what they believe is the appropriate solution to the problem that they're that they're experiencing. Yeah, that, that's great. And I see it's a non-exhaustive list, so you could bring yes. forward other ideas as well if you had them. Yeah. The last question, the so right underneath it is ineligible projects is roadway through lane capacity projects greater than one mile. <clears throat> so like a, a three quarter of a mile um, lane capacity project is also a pretty significant one, but would you be grading adding capacity in a positive fashion or would you really want the focus to be on um, these other kinds of examples of, of safety improvements that you were just talking about? Yeah, thank you for the question, Director Brockett. I think the intent really is to address safety problems. And I, I think in most cases, um, through capacity, uh, through lane capacity, probably uh, typically wouldn't be a good solution. We didn't want to entirely rule that out. Uh, there may be cases where, uh, for instance, it makes some sense at an intersection to do some additional channelization um, that might facilitate safer movement, reduce conflict points. Uh, so we didn't want to entirely rule that out, uh, but we definitely did want to um, avoid um, kind of using these limited funds that should be focused on safety problems from just adding vehicle capacity uh, to facilities. There are, there are plenty of other funding opportunities to do that, and we have lots of other funding opportunities uh, that fund those types of projects, and we really wanted to focus that. The other aspect of this, and, and quite frankly, the um, the reason for the one mile is that once you add capacity longer than a mile, you start to trigger the requirement for new air quality conformity determinations uh, for projects and more environmental review uh, that's inconsistent with trying to facilitate getting getting these projects moving uh, quickly. All right, makes sense, thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, Melinda, next question, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our next one is from uh, Nicholas Williams. So, Director Williams, you have the ability to speak. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ron, this is um, looking at two different types of funding, state and federal. As we apply for this funding, will we designate which type of funding we want, or will y'all parse that out kind of similar to the TIP process? Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for the question. Um, so, we will provide an opportunity for applicants to specify a preference if they have a preference uh, for funding type. Um, there are um, obviously some advantages uh, sometimes to getting state-only funds um, that avoid some of the particular um, uh, requirements that come with utilizing federal funds. So where a jurisdiction is eligible um, to use state funds on a state highway out of this program within CDOT Region 1. If there's a preference, we'll make that opportunity available to specify their preference. Um, as I said earlier, we, just, we simply can't guarantee um, that we'll be able to accommodate all of those preferences if, if, for instance, we get more requests for state funds than there is state funds available. Thank you. Thank you, Director Williams. Um, Melinda, next question, please. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our next one is from Jim Dale. So, Director Dale, you have the ability to speak. You just need to unmute yourself. Yes, with the impact of COVID-19 on revenue sources, I wonder if there's any consideration can be given to local match requirement. Thank you, Director Dale. Um, I think at this point, unfortunately, uh, for federal funds, there's been no there's been no granting of waiver on um, match requirements for federal funds. Uh, so 20% really is the minimum non-federal um, contribution that's required for the use of federal transportation funds at this point. I will I will say though, there is a fairly concerted effort. Um, that Dr. Cog's involved in with several other agencies and associations throughout the country um, that are recognizing that it's important to keep keep flowing what funds we have available uh, to to facilitate economic recovery 
um, as we as we move out of this initial response to COVID-19. Um, and that one of the things that may stand in the way of uh, fully utilizing the federal funds that are available to us is the reduced revenue, the reduced revenue that's going to local jurisdictions that might uh, limit their ability to provide match. Um, so while you know that will take some that will take some congressional action to um, provide some um, waiver um, of local match requirements for federal transportation funds. There's a lot of people talking about it and advocating for that, including Dr. Cog. But at this point, um, under existing law and rules, there is still a requirement for uh, a 20% match on those federal funds. Thank you. Thank you, Director Dale. Melinda, next question, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it looks like we don't have any new hands. I'm going to put all hands down at this point in case the directors uh, who have already spoken had another comment. Give everyone a moment just in case there are any other questions. Okay, at this time, uh, Mr. Chair, I am not seeing any other hands raised. Okay. With with no hands raised, we will now entertain a motion and a second for approval of the agenda item. Please use the raise hand icon to indicate you would like to make the motion. You'll be called on and unmuted to verbally state your motion. Melinda, we have a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, we do. It looks like uh, the first hand that was up was from Director Atchison. Uh, Director, you have the ability to unmute yourself and make the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move to approve a one-time exception to the 2020-2023 TIP waiting list protocol in order to use unanticipated Dr. Cog-directed surface transportation block grant funds to create an urban arterial multimodal safety improvements program and approve the eligibility rules and selection process for the program. Thank you, Director second. Anderson. Jessica Sandgren. We have a second by Director Sandgren. Thank you, Director Sandgren. Okay, here we go. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed, signify by saying no. And if so, I would like you to state your name after the conclusion of this. Um, any no's? Hearing no no's, any abstentions? All right, motion carries. Thank you so much, everyone. That is it for the um, the action item part of our uh, our agenda. Item nine: briefing on Dr. Cog AAA response to COVID-19. Uh, we are getting with Sanchez Warren's um, presentation uh, ready. So, uh, when you're ready, Ms. Sanchez Warren, please you have the floor. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, this is Melinda. Could you give me one moment to mute everyone again? Oh, I apologize, Melinda. No worries. All right, give me one second. Okay, Jayla and uh, Mr. Chair, you are able to speak. Thank you, Melinda. My apologies, Ms. Sanchez Warren, you have the floor now. Thank you so much. Um, it's wonderful to be here tonight, but I miss seeing you all. Uh, I, I'd like to talk to you about the Area Agencies on Aging's response to COVID-19. Next slide, please. So this, it feels like it was six months ago, honestly, that we started this, but it's only been like five and a half weeks. Um, the first started um, in, in the late part of February where we got my first training on um, COVID-19 from the Administration of Community Living. And then again, uh, uh, the state provided training on COVID-19 uh, on the 28th of February. Then the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging had a briefing on COVID-19. Uh, the Senate, yay, it was good news. The Senate passed the Older Americans Act this, at this time. Um, and then on March 6th, I gave a presentation to our staff about preparing for COVID-19. Next slide, please. On March 10th, uh, the governor declares a state of emergency, and we got, as a, as a AAA staff, our first possible exposure, uh, which freaked me out. Uh, and 
I uh, had to use my connections at the, hate, at the health department because everything I had been trained on the week before didn't work. So I called all the numbers that they told me to call, but everybody was so overwhelmed and busy. Uh, I was able to get a hold of the epidemiologist actually that trained us at the, at, at, uh, at the state. And she told me we were okay and we didn't have a staff exposure, so we didn't need to go into quarantine. Um, on, on March 11th, we had a preparedness meeting with providers. So I called in our transportation providers, our in-home providers, and our nutrition providers. And I said, guys, we need to prepare for this. We need to, I want you to really prioritize those folks that are most vulnerable and, and are gonna need assistance. I was anticipating that we would have to scale down services, but I wanted them to understand who didn't have family, who needed, uh, uh, who was homebound, who needed help with bathing or had incontinence issues, what transportation, who were we taking to dialysis and, and chemotherapy and radiation, all of those things. So we did that. Um, this is a time we also had our first call with governor's staff to talk about uh, what the area agencies on aging are doing. That same day, we got notification that three of our staff had been exposed in a meeting at TICPUF uh, to someone who had been exposed to COVID-19. And again, um, uh, it took a while to get confirmed, but we found out no quarantine needed. On March 12th, we had a meeting with Governor Polis um, and the state uh, area agencies on aging talking about just really helping him understand what we did and uh, what we thought we were gonna need, really not knowing a lot at that point. And then we had that next day, another possible staff exposure. At this time, our uh, HR director said, okay, that's it. Um, you all need to go home and work from home in the AAA because if you get an exposure, you're all gonna get quarantined. You won't be able to do what you need to do. And so you need to go home. And so we let everybody go home. Next slide. March 13th, uh, uh, President Trump declares a national emergency. Uh, Governor Polis uh, uh, urges cancellation of large group gatherings. Um, and we have our first death of, uh, of COVID in Colorado. And then on the 14th, the General Assembly suspends the legislative session. And we had been actively involved in advocating for the homestead funding um, for the state, but it wasn't, or, or for the area agencies on aging, but it wasn't looking very good given the, the state's uh, uh, economic picture for the next year. Next slide, please. So, you know, um, when you're a social worker, you study psychology like I did, um, you understand that there are, there are stages of grief. And I'm sure all of you have heard of that. Well, there are stages of COVID. And I really saw this with my staff, with the providers, with people that we worked with. That first, state, that first stage is, what's the big deal? 40,000 people die of the flu every year. What's the big deal? Just wash your hands, just relax. It's in China and Italy. Next. The second stage is, is this really happening? And this is where you start seeing people question, okay, is this really happening? What will happen to us? How can I stay, stay safe? Providers are saying, what? What does this mean for our business? How can we keep our doors open? How do we keep our staff safe? The next slide, please. The third stage is like, oh no, this is real. Um, and, I, and you see people kind of focus, like what can I do? How can we help? What are the needs? There's a lot of questions going on at this stage. How can we change what we're doing to meet the need? The fourth stage, is what do we need to do? So who needs what? Where are the people in need? Who can help us? How do we get what we need to help people? And then how, um, who can help us 
help. Next slide. And the fifth stage is, let's do this. And I saw some of my staff go through these processes really quickly. And I have staff that literally would, I felt like they were holding a sword saying, I will walk through fire to serve people, to serve our people. Um, and there was a combination of all sorts of feelings and emotions around this with individuals, with staff, with service uh, providers. Um, and I still see people like going through three, four, and five. Is this really real? Is this really happening? Okay, how do we deal with this, this step now? And then again, let's do it. At every iteration, it honestly feels like things change. Well, in those first couple of weeks, every day there was a new something. The, the, the third and fourth week, it was kind of like every other day, and now it's every three or four days. Next slide, please. So in that second week of, of March, Dr. Cog implements mandatory teleworking for everybody, not just the AAA. The state of Colorado Human Services starts weekly information calls. The administration provides daily information. The state unit on aging conducts support calls twice a week. So I am on calls all the time, um, listening, learning about needs, learning about what's available, trying to understand what's um, what other people are doing, um, including emergency response. Uh, the, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment now says no more than 10 people in a group, and the AAA begins to receive calls from emergency management agencies seeking resources for adults. So they're being able to identify people who need assistance um, but don't necessarily know the resources. So I spent a lot of time on the phone with county emergency response people that week and into the third week. Next slide, please. Um, the, on the, the second week, we start to um, hear fiscal concerns from our providers. They start and we start to realize that they get paid for the things that they do, right? Um, and and on, things are starting to close. So the dining sites are closed, home visits are ceased, rides are restricted to only those people most in need and the the providers out there are saying wait a second i get paid to transport people i get paid to go do home visits i get paid to um to serve people in adult day all i get paid to serve people in congregate meal sites all of those things are closing how am i going to make payroll how am i going to keep my doors open uh, the Tri-County Health Department and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment asked the AAA to help identify all senior housing, and actually Brad's team did this for us and, and put together uh, information for both of those entities. Uh, the, the AHC, the Denver Regional Accountable Health Communities, begins receiving inquiries about food resources from hospitals and the hospital and folks in the hospital. And then staff start advocating for emergency fund, funds from the state to help providers keep operating. So we're hearing this from a lot of our providers. We're not sure. We can't pay them for, for operating funds, but they need operating funds to keep on providing. So it's like this vicious cycle. Some of them had to reduce their staff. That means they had less ability to serve and get money. And it's, um, it's the spiraling downward. And Rich um, and our lobbyists at the state started helping us advocate um, uh, for emergency funds. Next slide. Uh, this is week two, uh, or um, that's not week two anymore, is it? Yeah, I guess it's two. <laughs> Um, the AAA continues to work closely with county and providers to understand needs. We're hearing a lot about food, a lot about food, a lot about personal needs uh, or personal items like toilet paper, incontinence products, a lot of how do I get my medication. Uh, the, color, the state of Colorado starts to relax requirements at this time on background checks and some of the older Americans Act um, uh, uh, requirements, which allows for more people to volunteer in nutrition. 
and the in this week uh, there was like 50 some routes that weren't covered uh, by by volunteers because a lot of the volunteers uh, are were older are, are older and they decided to not risk uh, their health and so they stopped volunteering um, at the same time nursing homes are closed uh, uh, there, no one's allowed to go into nursing homes. So I diverted our staff that go into nursing homes, the transitions team and the ombudsman to help uh, deliver food um, during those that, that week and the week after. Next slide, please. So this is the way we work now and we're all learning uh, how to work at home. This is my station. Um, I, you, I, you can't, you do see a Diet Coke there, but there's usually a Red Bull there too somewhere. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> a little levity, right? We need a little levity. So in week three, Seniors Resource Center, this is our second largest contractor, um, announces that they're cutting staff by 80% and will only provide services to those most in need. So those, you know, there are they are the primary transportation provider in the region, and so they they reduced. Uh, they went from about six to eight hundred trips. A, 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 I want to. It's not a day. A day. This is a, week, a day. Maybe. Yep. A day. <laughs> it is. Sorry. Um, to like a hundred and and twelve. I think was the maximum they were doing. Um, uh, and. Uh, only focusing on dialysis, chemotherapy. We're also hearing about other transportation providers reducing their services. So we hear about um, Accessoride cutting back. We hear that the, the Cancer Society is reducing or, or is eliminating all the uh, transportation that they provide for folks going to chemo and cancer treatment. Uh, the, the AAA, meet with contractors to share ideas and assess needs at this time. Contract amendments start. So now we're looking at, all right, what can we do to help our service providers? So those folks that we used to pay to take to the grocery store, um, take people to the grocery store, or to take them to the doctors, where we change the way we do things, we retool our whole system, and we started paying them to deliver food, personal items, and medications. For those people that we paid to go in into people's homes to help them, we paid them to do reassurance calls. We paid um, people to go out and buy things that they knew people needed um, and, and deliver it to them. So that was a big, a, a big shift for us our um, business support team in, in administration and finance really uh, has done a yeoman's job in adjusting everything that we do. So remember, this is still federal dollars. We still have to be accountable. We have to be transparent. We have to be fair. So documenting all of this stuff is essential, but we were able to retool pretty quickly and get payments out to our providers so to help them uh, keep their doors open and their staff employed. Uh, we continue to advocate for the homestead exemption funds to help providers with operating costs, uh, but not to much success. The AAA uh, staff uh, participate in lots of calls with the state unit on aging, with the governor's office and the administration on community living. Next slide. Uh, Governor Polis orders all closure of non-essential business. President Trump signs the Older Americans Act. Yay! Um, we get the designation of the major disaster declaration. This is really important for us because that um, really opens up or, or, or allows the state to minimize the regula regulations of the money that we're going to get. And we're notified um, that we're going to receive $1.5 million in emergency funds for nutrition services. Next slide. So this is how we meet. It's not a good picture, but this is how we meet. when We're discussing things now, uh, all learning how to do this, as I'm sure you are too. Next slide. So 
in this week of March 30th, we find out this is the first time we start to really hear about COVID in long-term care facilities. And at the beginning of the week, we hear that we have four long-term care facilities that have confirmed COVID outbreaks, nine statewide. Um, we get an option letter for the $1.5 million. So that's like record time, right? We hear about it, it's at the state and the state turns that money around and um, we're about to get it, which is shocking. And then at the same time, we hear we're going to get another $5 million in the next relief package uh, uh, for uh, aging services, which was a shock to everyone. Um, Doug and I were stunned when we heard that news. A senior Resource Center announces on the 1st of April that they will no longer provide transportation services beginning July 1st, which is really scary for us. And um, as a result, we start having meetings um, internally um, at Dr. Cog with transportation division and the planning division and aging, working together to really talk about the transportation options in the region. By Kayla. April 4th, yes. This is Doug. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, just before you bump off that slide, I just want to say about the Senior Resources Center. Um, we've had further conversations with um, with with their staff over there, and you know this them no longer providing transportation services is predicated on in um, on the idea that they don't get any uh, you know an additional infusion of money. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Thank you for that. Um, just in a few days, we learned that 17 long-term care facilities have um, outbreaks and, and 32 residents have died. Next slide. So um, things start to settle down now. It's not as busy. I mean, there's still calls all day long, but nothing changing as rapidly. Um, we have our first ever in my history, and I've been at Dr. Cog 31 years. Um, we had our first uh, a virtual aging advisory committee meeting. Um, we continue to have weekly calls with our providers, just trying to understand what the needs are, as well as for, for clients and older adults in our communities, but also for um, them. Uh, as providers. Um, I did a presentation today uh, on the, to the Colorado Resource Center, which is an association of nonprofits. And then tomorrow we have another call with the governor. Um, we currently have 52 facilities uh, in the state that, or, or in our region, sorry, in our region that have COVID. 278 confirmed cases, 31 suspected, um, but not confirmed, and 62 have died um, confirmed of COVID. In Boulder, there are eight facilities um, with 35 residents confirmed, 16 probable, and five deaths. In Weld County, there's four facilities with COVID, 18 unconfirmed cases, 15 probable, and six deaths. Next slide, please. So those, that's been kind of, like I said, it feels like it's been six months, but it's only been about five and a half weeks since it all started and it's moving quick. And I'm super proud of my staff and super proud of the area agencies on aging across the state. We've all really retooled quickly to respond to the need. Uh, now we're talking, you know, um, we've been able to really identify where those pockets of need are. For example, there's a group of, of, uh, of folks in Conifer that, that uh, need food and we're, we're working with different uh, providers to get that food. We're figuring out how to serve um, in Gilpin and Clear Creek, as well as the Eastern Plains, working with all of your county uh, folks, um, I, I, it's just been it's it's challenging, but it's also uplifting that that we have been able to respond um, as quickly as we as we have. And I and I need to thank my boss because Doug has been there by my side 
helping me through this, attending meetings, uh, learning on the fly, um, helping us advocate. Uh, uh, he's been a, a real integral part of, of this whole time. So does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Ms. Sanchez Warren. Um, board, any questions for Ms. Sanchez Warren? Linda, any questions? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our first one is from Linda Olson. Uh, Director Olson, you are now unmuted and have the ability to speak. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jayla, for this great information. I know it's been a, a, a tough five weeks. It has been for many of us. <laughs> we all have our different challenges. <laughs> I um, was on the phone with one of our more our independent living uh, buildings here in the city of Englewood and uh, they had four deaths in the last um, week or so, and they know they have four that have tested positive. They're trying very hard to isolate, and this is just an independent living, not transitional. Right. And, and um, I asked, besides a number of other things that we thought we could do as a city, what else do you really need? And she said, a rapid testing. And I'm wondering what you're hearing about that, and could we uh, be putting pressure from all of the different sectors that we represent. And I'm not sure what the solution is, but I know that having them come in so slowly is really not helpful. She could have used 21 today and it would have yeah. helped them isolate. Definitely an issue in those big places, you know, in, uh, throughout the, the region like Heather Gardens and um, have a huge populations of older adults. Rapid testing is, is, is very important. There's a lot of talk about it. There's a lot of different, even some, some um, laboratories here in, in the metro area that are working on it, but nothing that feels like it's near enough to be helpful in the next few weeks or so. Um, it, it, it worries me a lot because uh, it would be helpful to know, you know, a lot of the staff that work in long-term care or 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 in in this area have to have more than one job. So um, it would be essential in my mind to test those folks so they don't take it from one place to another place to another place. And I think that's how we've seen the spread happen in long-term care facilities. I don't have any answers for you. I'm sorry. Well, pardon my ignorance, but where where do they? Where do they come from? The different clinics that have them. How, how do you even get them? Is it through the state, or how do we do this? Um, the rapid testing right yeah. now is through the state. I know other laboratories in the metropolitan area uh, and in the state are working on it, uh, trying to find, uh, trying to get a rapid test that they can verify that's working. But right now, it's just through the state, as far as I know. So everybody goes through the same state agency office to get them, and then they go out to different labs, and that's why the timing is so different. That's not the rapid, but the other ones. Yeah, uh, yeah, and there and and other labs in the metro area are working on just testing, right? So they go to different labs, and yeah, sometimes it takes longer for some labs than other labs to get results. It, it if you can think of something we can all do to have a unified voice. I know that the governor's hands are tied too. We can't just produce those out of thin air. Um, yeah. I think there's, yeah, um, I, I, like I said, I'm on a call with him tomorrow, so I'll make sure I, I express that. Thank you, Director Thank you. Olson. Uh, Melinda, uh, next hand, please, or next board member, please. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it looks like our next one will be from Sally Daigle. Um, Director Daigle, I am unmuting you and you have the ability to speak. Hi, Jella. Thank you so much for all your work. I really appreciate it. Um, and um, I'm I, knowing that you're going to talk with the governor tomorrow. Um, you could also um, questions that I've come up against as a private duty nurse. Um, uh, with patients that receive supplies different supplies, whether it's incontinent supplies or um, uh, ventilator and trach supplies and what have you in their homes. We've been told by supply companies um, to boil gloves um, and to boil and reuse items that normally we would throw away at the end of 30 days, like trach or ventilator tubing. We're now told that we need to boil those. Um, oxygen tubing, same thing. 
Um, and typically in a home situation, patients don't really um, throw those things away willy nilly. You know, they'll use them for two weeks or, or 30 days and then they replace them with new items. Um, but we're being told by supply companies, you need to start boiling these things um, and reusing things um, to the best of your ability. And um, is there a possibility that you could bring that up with the governor? What do we do about supply chains where supplies that are normally going to home care patients are now being diverted into the hospitals and then these home care patients aren't getting anything. Myself as a private duty nurse, I've not been able to lay my hands on hand sanitizer, so I have resorted to making hand sanitizer, yeah. which is getting harder to do because I can't find aloe vera gel or 91% alcohol because other people are doing that for their own uses. Yeah. Um, I don't use a mask because I can't get a hold of a mask. So I'm using, you know, a bandana as a mask. Um, and, and so these are, you know, I, I, and I get the, the, you know, nursing homes and assisted livings where there's multiple people, but there are also the forgotten home care patients that are being, you know, left to their own devices really. And then also um, because I, I um, often, myself will work on call at a nursing home, um, have been in contact with them. Um, they're not letting anybody come in right now. They're just keeping staff in staff as best they can. So they're not letting any of us come in to help out or anything, but they're not getting supplies. So um, yeah, uh, I, I, what I hear can what we do I... about something like that? And is there is there a way, is the governor working on getting supplies into the hands of medical personnel where, because you can't go out and you can't buy these things because they're right. off the shelves? Right. So I, um, a week, two weeks ago, I would have said no way and there's no way we could advocate for that because it was all focused on hospitals, right? And, right. and rightfully so. But now right. I think... Um, that uh, people are are starting to think about, okay, what's next? And there's more talk about uh, all the area agencies we're talking about what's next and how do we roll our services back out? It's not gonna be for a while yet, but we need to start thinking about it. And one thing we all understand is that we need PPE, um, personal protective equipment um, uh, for, for our providers, but you guys are like so, there's there's the hospital and those are like the first responders then those the home health aid people the folks going in to actually help um people uh you know dress bathe um take their medications provide care for them that's like the second responders and then i think i i see uh most of the triple a services as like the third responders um i will definitely relay that i have heard it as well uh, not enough equipment. I know that masks are starting to become more available. I have a few in my office that if you um, want to meet me, I can give you one um, or two. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm more concerned are, about But I will certainly masks. bring that to the attention because we've heard that too, that uh, people that are at home you know, caregivers in particular, from caregivers, that they're not getting the stuff they need to help their loved ones, not getting the supplies, can't find um, right. uh, the tubes that you're talking about right. uh, for trachs in particular. I've been hearing more yep. about that than anything yep. else. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and of course, those are the patients I take care of, ventilated patients. Yeah. And so, yep. and, and boiling tubes is fine. not safe. But, not safe. But, no, not necessarily safe, and I'm I'm okay with that. But I'm really not okay with, you know, doing wound care and then boiling my gloves and yeah. reusing them. Yeah, that's especially not from, you know, and from one day to the next, or God forbid, from one patient to the next, which could be occurring, not in my situation, but um, it, it's getting kind of scary. Yep. Director Daigle, thank you so much. Melinda, next You're question. Welcome.
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our next one uh, will be from Stephanie Walton. So, Director Walton, I will unmute you now, and you have the ability to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Jayla. Um, this is a, amazing, the work that you've been doing. And um, I just really please um, send thanks to all of the staff and um, just huge appreciation for everything you're doing for our seniors. You're always such a big advocate, but um, it's such a stressful time for people. And I, my heart really goes out to anybody who is, you know, worried about um, a family member or a friend in a facility um, because it seems difficult to even get information. Um, yeah, they have one. Uh, I'm sorry. To that point, the health department just put up on their website the facilities um, that have it and the number of people that are confirmed in the number of deaths. So that just went up today at like 4.30. Thank you. I was wondering if you could just repeat the um, numbers for Boulder, please. I didn't have my pencil ready. And then also I wondered if you do have any other ideas or suggestions of things that local municipalities um, or local governments could be doing. Thank you. Okay, um, in Boulder, there there are eight, as far as I know, and this changes, you know, regularly, um, eight facilities that have confirmed cases, uh, 35 residents, 16 are probable, um, com so 35 confirmed cases, 16 probable, and there have been five deaths. But on the, I, I just looked at the health department website and they have the names of the facilities and, and information about staff that have it as well. So that's going to be very um, helpful. I think that I, I have been so impressed with what our cities and counties are doing to organize around this effort and really working collaboratively. Um, I don't know if your question was related to long-term care or just in general. Can you help me a little bit more with that? Um, just, it, just in general, I think that um, some of the things that you've reported on there is a kind of focus. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about are um, in my community, social isolation, um, you know, people that would would be getting out and, and having regular meals and some social time. Um, I, I, those are just some of the things that are top of mind. Yeah, I think so. There are some communities. I don't think that, you just solve the world though, yeah. Jayla. We can, <laughs> we, can really, we can talk about this offline, but there are some ideas and there are some kind of innovative things, you know, people organizing, um, school um, um, schools to write letters um, uh, to residents, um, uh, anything to outreach, um, having volunteer uh, people to just call, uh, putting entertaining things on your website about the city and then letting people know that it's, you know, that it's out there funny, anything funny, anything funny <laughs> right now people could use. I really feel the, the folks that are most worried about are those folks that, um, in isolation, those folks that struggle with um, depression and anxiety and have issues with mental health, as well as folks with dementia. We're seeing a big change in folks with dementia um, because they're not having that stimula stimulation. So um, they just seem to be closing in uh, uh, and, and not uh, participating as much. And I think there's gonna be a lot of work to do when we get to go back out and figure out what's going on in our communities and how to support our individuals. So we need to think about now, but really plan for what it's gonna look like in the next six months and how we can help those folks um, in facilities. Uh, I have no idea what they're going through. Um, I know that if a facility gets designated or has COVID, they, they tend to lose staff and they don't come back. So um, I think there's a lot that's going on that we don't know about that we're going to learn about. Thank you, Director Walton. Melinda, next question, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our next one is from Kevin Flynn. So Director Flynn, I will unmute you and you will need to unmute yourself to speak. Thank you. 
Uh, Jayla, first of all, thank you very much to you and the staff for uh, marshalling through all this. It probably at times feels like you're changing a tire on a moving car uh, because of how this thing is evolving. I'm curious yeah. whether you've had time amid all the, the, the rush and the, uh, and the changes that you've had to do. Have you had time to think about what the landscape might look like post COVID? Are, are, are providers going to cease to, will some of them go away? Uh, because of uh, these layoffs and, or furloughs and lack of funding? Will we see a realignment or a reconfiguration of the, of the service uh, uh, horizon here? Uh, what do you see coming that we ought to be thinking about and be prepared for? Yeah, I've actually been thinking a lot about this this week and, and having more conversations about it um, uh, with uh, one of the people that I'm talking to is is uh, Dr. John Douglas, who's the director of Tri County Health. He's a he yeah. specializes in an in infectious disease and worked at the CDC for years. I, I've been talking with him about what's it going to look like. I don't know if we're going to have the same provider base that we have now. To be honest with you, as some of them have already had to furlough people, the longer that we go on this, I think there's more risk of that. Some have, though. The good news has been applying for those those uh, grants or those loans. It's hard though for a nonprofit to pay back loans. And so hopefully if they can keep all their staff, then they can uh, get forgiveness for those loans. That's really important. Do you see I anything? About, go ahead. I'm sorry. Do you see anything you're doing now as you're, as you're changing up the way services are delivered? Do you see anything that we can take with us out, you know, when this is over? Uh, you know, like the, the grocery deliveries rather than taking people to go get groceries, deliver the groceries or yeah, are there any that think, are positive, that are positive changes coming out of this? Yeah, uh, we're certainly learning a lot, right? We're learning a lot about how to serve people in a different way. I think one of the things that's happened is that we might have more um, people that stay on our services. They didn't know about them or uh, they didn't trust them and now they didn't have a choice and so they they um, invite us as sin and they're like, oh, it's not too bad. So we're gonna stay with them. Uh, the, the, I don't think congregate meal programs are gonna come back for probably a year. I would be surprised if they come back because the thing that we have to remember is the virus is still gonna be here even when right. we get to go back to work. Um, and our population, particularly those 80 and over are the most vulnerable. How do we gear up for that? How, right. when do we start going back into people's homes to help them? When do we start taking people into transportation? Yes, drive by, pick up food, taking food um, and delivering it to them. You know, there's all these things. Um, I think people that we used to serve and take them to the grocery store really look forward to like grocery store Tuesday, right? Because sure. it's socialization and they get out of the house. But I don't know if we're going to be able to do that. So we're going to have to continue to innovate, understand what the needs are, what the, the risks are, and, and adapt to those. All right. Thank you. I look forward to uh, continuing this. Thank you. Thank you, Director Flynn. Uh, Melinda, next question, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like we do have another one. Uh, it is from Larry Strock. So, Director Strock, I will unmute you and you will have the ability to speak. Go ahead. Uh, Gayla, thank you for everything you do. And, and tomorrow, I, I think you should tell the governor that you're Dr. Cog strong. Thank you. <laughs> I, and that has power. It has power with the governor. Um, and so uh, I, I, I will look for an opportunity. <laughs> Sounds Thank good. Thank you. Thank you, Director Strzok. Uh, Linda, any other questions? At this point in time, I am not seeing any other hands. Great. Jayla, thank you so much for all, all you do and all your staff does. We, we, we truly appreciate it as the words of many board directors have, uh, have told you throughout this, uh, this, this question and answer period. So again, thank you so much and continued success in trying to fight this, uh, fight this virus. And let's hope we get some, some uh, additional funding for you. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Um, Next, uh, the next item are committee reports. Um, the committee reports. I will uh, I will call the the, uh, the committee report. 
Um, the representative who is identified, um, Melinda will open your mic and you will then provide your report. So Melinda, the first report is the report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, Director Jones. Yes, thank you, Mr. All right. Chair. Yep, go ahead. All right. Uh, the last stack meeting was on Friday. It was our uh, uh, online meeting, as we uh, all all of our meetings are these days. Pretty pretty um, light agenda. We got an update on the the federal aid packages. Uh, Rebecca White gave us an update and an overview of the draft 2045 statewide transportation plan. The hope is that um, Stack will approve it for release for public comment next month with the goal of having the Transportation Commission adopt it in June. And then we also received a status update on how the transit agencies are doing around the state. As you won't be surprised to hear that most of them have seen major declines in ridership. A third of them have completely shut down. Um, Colorado is receiving about $325 million in CARES Act funding for transit. 70% um, of that is coming to RTD, about 20, $232 million. Um, unfortunately, that's probably not going to be enough to fully cover their impact, but it, it will um, be somewhat helpful to them as they deal with their financial crisis. And I'm sure Bill Van Meer can tell us more about that. So that's it from Stack. Thank you, Director Jones. Uh, the next report is uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director Atchison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple of things that uh, Metro Mayor's has continued and we've uh, converted like most others to a virtual meeting even for the caucus. Uh, the Metro Mayor's Caucus uh, this week earlier sent a letter to the governor specifically aimed at having conversation about what happens after stay at home. And we've asked also in two areas. One, if you're going to have another extension, please include local elected officials, either both county and municipalities, into the conversation so we're not getting surprised about extensions hours before they happen. But most importantly, engage the local elected officials also in any decision about removing stay at home so that we can be better prepared for those. Uh, the other piece that uh, Metro Mayors has been engaged in, uh, we started through Metro Mayors a fundraising event being whether it's loans or grants to our small business communities. As of um, Tuesday morning, the Metro Mayors group had raised $15 million in commitment for support of our small business communities. Uh, Westminster is an example we raised, we put into the pot 1.5 million in our own city. We opened up our application process on Monday morning of this week at 8 a.m. and we had to shut it down Tuesday night at 5 because we had already received 400 applications which may have exceeded the amount of funds that we had. This is not uncommon. I know a couple of other cities like Arvada and a couple of others have had to shut down theirs because they believe they've reached their limits. So that's pretty well what's going on. Most of us been concentrating from Metro Mayors on how to get us back to business, whether or not we stay in, uh, at home much longer, but also trying to support our small business communities. Mr. Chair, that's my report. Thank you, Director Atchison. The next report is from the Metro Area County Commissioners. Uh, Director Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We actually have not had a meeting since our last Dr. Cog. Great. Thank you, Director Partridge. Um, uh, next report, uh, Advisory Committee on Aging, uh, Ms. Sanchez-Warren, is, is there additional comment? Um, uh, th that um, we had our first uh, meeting, like I said, virtual meeting. Uh, we, re we reviewed uh, the, the recommendations of funding allocations for the service providers um, and the full ACA uh, reviewed and uh, voted on them and moved them forward to the funding uh, to the um, F and B committee uh, finance and budget uh, to uh, that and they voted on them tonight so that's good uh, we gave them the same presentation that I gave you and then we discussed the COVID relief funding that we're getting that 1.6 million in nutrition and then 5 million um, 
uh, coming down the way in the second relief package. That's my report. Thank you. Uh, next report, uh, Regional Air Quality Council, Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, so uh, RAC staff, as well as the board, they're full bore now in, in, uh, in serious area ozone SIP development. SIP stands for State Implementation Plan. Um, so they reviewed a couple of, of the chapters of that document, the air quality data chapter and the reasonal, reasonably available control measures chapter. Um, I might also note the there's a there's a committee of RAC called the Control Strategy Committee, um, and they've established three new working groups. Um, one is the, the Clean Air Fund Work Group, the uh, Inspection and Maintenance and Fuels Work Group, and uh, last but not least, Employer-Based Trip Reduction Work Group. So those are three new committees that um, members of the RAC board, as well as outside participants, will will be involved with. Thank you, sir. That's my report. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. Next report, E-470 Authority, Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, E-470 Board met on March 12th uh, for the last meeting. Um, I think the highlight of the meeting was uh, from the Finance Department. Uh, we saw an introduction of an economic impact study briefing. Um, we then went into a discussion pertaining to uh, future toll rate reductions. And uh, we were briefed, the board was briefed on the capability that we think we have to lower um, tolls next year on E470. 20% uh, reduction at uh, toll gate A, which is that one between I-25 and Parker, and then 7% reduction on the other toll gates uh, throughout the system. Um, pretty, uh, I think uh, everyone on the board was uh, very impressed with the analysis, uh, very impressed with the work that went into it. And um, I can say anecdotally, uh, the word on the street, uh, talking to people in the community um, is uh, those rate reductions would be welcome. Uh, and then we went into a briefing on the debt management uh, policy and uh, uh, E-470 is looking to conduct a restructuring of debt this summer. Um, we're all keeping our fingers crossed that with COVID, uh, that won't be affected. We hope to hear positively on that tomorrow. Um, so it was a great meeting, great meeting about, uh, um, you know, the impact that E-470 has in the region, as well as uh, future plans to reduce tolls. Mr. Chairman, if there are no questions, that concludes my brief. Thank you, Director Teal. And, and as a follow-up speaking, as the uh, chair of the finance uh, subcommittee at D470, a lot of those events that Director Teal talked about uh, happened previous to COVID. And um, ironically enough, it's it's still tracking that we would be in a position to uh, to consider reducing tolls. So uh, with that, uh, the next report is CDOT, uh, Director White. Hello, thanks, Mr. Chair, and good evening, everyone. Uh, like like you all, CDOT is primarily focused on on handling all that COVID is throwing at us. Um, with our you know most pressing obligation is to make sure our roads stay safe, and that means making sure our maintenance crews uh, can get out there in, in storms like we're seeing come in tonight and tomorrow. We continue to plow the roads. Uh, we've also really focused on keeping the construction projects um, moving. Lots of the Great to have that uh, sort of economic contribution in this time. So a lot of effort on uh, applying social distancing and other best practices to our active construction work. Uh, and then uh, we will pivot next to sort of understanding the, the full financial um, fallout of COVID uh, for transportation for CDOT. So a lot more to come on that in the coming weeks. And I think that's uh, all I needed to touch on tonight, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Director White. Uh, next report, Fast Tracks. Director Van Meter. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is Bill Van Meter. So the April 7th meeting of the Planning, Capital Programs, and Fast Tracks Committee uh, of the RTD Board of Directors was a very light agenda and nothing really of note or significance from that meeting to report. But I do have some general uh, items of probable interest to this body um, and and not surprisingly they're also COVID-19 centered. 
Director Jones noted the financial impact on agencies and some of the um, financial opportunities from the CARES Act and noted that RTD is expecting about $232 million. Um, that sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. Our forecasts are um, very early for forecasts based on very limited data and information that that likely will not be enough to offset our bare box revenue and um, sales and use tax losses, that the losses will exceed that number handily. Um, so we are trying to figure out that and tracking information as it comes in. Our board did hear from the Leeds School of Business uh, in their semi-annual update regarding um, the, the economy and forecasts for sales and use tax and economic forecasts for the metro area just last night at the Financial Administration Audit Committee. And the lead school had um, you know, bad news to report, but also um, some um, optimism that the downturn won't be extremely deep and long. Um, I think I can safely state that they were hedging their bets, but heading in that direction a little bit, they hope. Mm -hmm. RTD's ridership, average weekday prior to COVID-19, averaged about 350,000 boardings a day on bus and rail. It's averaging, it's stabilized right around 125,000 boardings. So 350,000 average weekday boardings prior to um, this down, this um, pandemic, and it stabilized at about 125,000 um, on an average weekday over the last couple of weeks. In response, on April 19th, the Sunday, we will be implementing our COVID-19 service plan. It's a service reduction, um, and it's based basically on the levels of service that we typically provide on a Saturday throughout the district for bus and on Sunday for rail. Information is posted on our website, details um, what that COVID-19 service plan looks like. And we also ha um, have limits, passenger limits, that we are trying to achieve on both, both our bus and rail vehicles. And we uh, have, have suspended fare collection um, for the foreseeable future. And so we're implementing ever more um, stringent and um, we believe quite proactive actions um, to address the issue. So that ends my re attempt at a re cogent uh, report. Thank you, Director Van Meter. Uh, that ends the informational briefing section. Uh, next items, uh, informational items, uh, item 11. Uh, transportation Improvement Program Administrative Modifications. Please review that at your leisure. Uh, the, the next part, administrative items. Uh, our next meeting is May 20th, 2020. Uh, next item, other matters by members. If anyone has other matters, please raise your virtual hand. Melinda, um, please let me know if there are any, any hands Oh. Yes, thank you. Oh, yes, we do. Uh, it looks like our first one is from Aaron Brockett. Uh, Director Brockett, Brockett, I will unmute you now and you should have the ability to speak. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I just thought we might wish Director Walton a happy birthday. <laughs> All right. Director happy. Walton, happy birthday. Thank you, Director happy Brockett. Birthday. Um, it would be very tough and I think very ugly if we all sang happy birthday based on the, the uh, yays and nays that, that we previously went through. So we'll wish her a happy birthday and move on. Uh, Melinda, any any other hands up? Uh, I do see Director Walton. Uh, I'll go ahead and unmute her and let her speak. Right. Sounds good. Director Walton. Hi, thank you, Director Brocken. Thank you, everyone. It's been um, a weird, birthday um, I've been I've had kind of bouts of sadness throughout the day and I don't know if it 
if I'm sad because it's a it's a big number or if I'm just sad because of the state of the world. But um, it was an odd day to have a birthday. And so um, I, I know I'm not the only one having a birthday, but I do have good news. I did. Um, I did decide that since income tax filing deadline has changed to July 15th, I would just change my birthday to July 15th. So no need to sing now. Hopefully I'll see you all in July. Thank you, Director Walton. Appreciate it. Any additional hands? Uh, at this time, I'm seeing no additional hands. All right, seeing none. Um, the next item is adjournment at 817. I move to adjourn. Um, everybody, please, uh, please stay safe and, and healthy out there. Thank you so much. And this concludes our uh, board of directors meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair.